she is like a mother to so many. She gave birth to the media <laughs> access. She's a producer, a director, an author. She's done children's programming, sitcoms, series, after school specials. She is a trailblazer. It's Fern Field. <laughs> Hello, Fern. Hi, David. <laughs> You're so sweet. You're very, very sweet. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, you're amazing and wonderful, and, uh, and thank you for you. Well, the funny thing is, uh, when I used to, say, people used to ask me about my television career, and I used to say, I've done everything there is to do except a game show. And then a couple of years ago for the CSUSB Palm Desert campus, I, did, I created a game show, the, the Coachella Valley Grammar Bee. <laughs> <laughs> the least qualified person on the planet to do a game show. Oh my God. Was, we, had a, we had fun, it was great. That is fun, that is fun. So when people say, Fernfield, you're a trailblazer, what comes to your mind? Well, of course, the biggest thing that ever, you know, that I ever did, and it was by accident, like my entire life, which is why my autobiography is going to be titled My Accidental Life. Uh, and the truth is, had I not been working for Norman Lear, none of it would have happened. You know, I could have had the same job at, a, at Mary Tyler Moore, but, you know, it wouldn't have happened because uh, the whole movement was triggered by an episode we did on Ma on Maud about her going back for her college reunion and her best friend roommate. Uh, do you hear that noise on Wilshire Boulevard? I know it sounds like uh, it it's like sounds... it's like living on Times Square. You know, <laughs> I pic I picture dykes on bikes. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, that, exactly. That's probably what it was. But anyway, this episode on uh, on Maud yeah. uh, with her roommate, played by Nanette Fabre, came back and she was uh, had, had a stroke and was in a wheelchair and everything. And the reaction to that is what started the whole ball rolling. So had I not been present there and then, not, none of it would have happened. And of course, working for Norma Lear, every door was open. So um, by accident, we got involved and produced uh, this short that was nominated for an Oscar titled A Different Approach. Yes. It was really groundbreaking and started, that gave birth to the Media Access Awards and everything else. And that was more than 40 years ago, so. Well, tell me, so A Different Approach was first, and that was what, 1978? Yeah, yeah. We were nominated for the best short um, in 1978, and again, that happened by accident. And that was uh, and it was show. it was really groundbreaking. T today, it's not so unusual, but then uh, the committee we did it for they were white knuckled. They were afraid. I too was afraid that we would get sued and everything. And then it was first premiered at a luncheon. Uh, given by the South Bay Mayor's Committee for Employment of the Handicapped, and it was the first time any disabled people were screening it. Right. And afterwards, they were so happy, they were so thrilled. And of course, after that, everybody claimed ownership, you know, before we had a disclaimer on the film. Right, right. It's interesting how, you know, somebody wants to create something and people are like scared of it, but then when it's a big hit, everybody says, Oh yes, I was a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But the, the most the most rewarding thing was when we did a you know, it was it was conceived because the South Bay Mayor's Committee wanted a, a conversation breaker when they went to talk to employers about hiring people with disabilities. And uh, when we screened it at the old director's guild uh, building. Uh, my friends called me afterwards and they said, you know, when we first got there, we were very uncomfortable because we had some extremely se uh, severely disabled people at the screening. We had used them in the movie. Yeah. And my friend said we were really uncomfortable. And then after we saw the film, we went over and talked. And that's exactly what the film was designed to do. Yeah. Uh, you so, know, I, I, I put a message out on Facebook that 
you were going to be interviewed. And a few people actually responded uh, with some questions. Um, okay. Ther Teresa Direx said, what are your favorite types of films to produce? And is there any way people can watch or get a copy of a different approach? Uh, well, first of all, I like to make good films. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody once called me a social issues groupie. So when you look at my credits, you'll find that almost, almost every single one had something to do with changing, touching people's lives, changing people's lives. Um, a different approach, probably you can get it on YouTube, maybe. Um, I have, you know, some, I'm going to di digitize it, but at this point, I think it's possibly available on YouTube. Some of my after school specials are on YouTube. Um, I'm, I, you know, I, on my list of things to do is to digitize everything. Yeah. yeah. And, um, for the most part, um, that's how you get to see it or at screenings and stuff like that. If anybody wants, of course, now we can't do any of this, but if anybody wanted to organize a screening or something like that, I would be happy to, I have some DVDs, I would be happy to come at a screening and talk about it. But, you know, the film is dated. It's, it's such a different world now. We use the word handicapped, which is a no-no these days mm -hmm. and everything. And so sometimes we, when we show the film, we get a, a, a mixed response because some people still love it. They, you know, and everybody was after me to do an updated version, but you can't really do an updated version of that film because it's a different world. I mean, do, doors are open. People are much more um, non-handicapped people, non-disabled people are used to are used to seeing more disabled people. So you can't do what we did in 1978. But in 1978, it was groundbreaking and happily resonated around the world. Well, what was so oh, great uh, that it was the door the world. Yes. And now, yes. instead of remaking it, we move forward and, and create work for for everyone for inclusion exactly exactly but the most interesting thing was the changes that brought about in our lives in the non-disabled people and uh one of my favorite uh, stories is about uh, our terrifically talented uh, choreographer who did the busby berkeley you know, Joel Paley, and we were auditioning people in the garage at Metro Media. It was a February, and it was pouring rain, and that's when I learned some of these fans don't fit into garages. <laughs> anyway, these people were coming in and, and on crutches and wheelchairs and everything, and Joel came over to me at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he said, Fern, what am I supposed to say? I can't say step one, two, three. And I looked at him, I didn't have an answer for that. He said, should I say wheel one, two, three? And I said, that sounds pretty good to me. And he pranced off to do his auditions. Well, by, by five o'clock that day, he yeah. was so comfortable working with people with disabilities that this woman showed up. She was in a wheelchair with a caregiver. And he said, hi, can I help you? <laughs> and she said, yes, I'm here to audition. He said, oh, sweetheart, I'm sorry, I can't use you because originally we had created this number to be done with people in wheelchairs and their attendants. And then we realized that's counter to the message that we're trying to send. So we, I can't use you. And she said, I have a wheelchair at home that I can con uh, you know, control with my mouth. He said, come back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And, and, and he placed her center screen and my partner and my cinematographer went ballistic and they said, Fern, you can't do that. I said, what? Like, you can't put her center screen. You know, it'll be a turnoff. I said, that's what this movie is supposed to deal with. And I had to go to the head of the committee to tell her, Marsha, you have to, you have to back me up on this. The, and the best news about that, David, is I was telling this story the other day, I think, well, the other day, probably nine months ago. I might have been there. It was at the, some university uh, a meeting, and uh, 
I was telling this story and there was a young woman in a wheelchair. And, and when, I when I quoted what my cinematographer said, that it'll be a turnoff, she said, really? She was really surprised at that because obviously she had never encountered any, you know, any prejudice, any kind of response, negative response. And that, you know, thank God, 40 years later makes a big difference. Right, right. I just got this and I kept on asking myself, why do people, why are people feeling that certain way? Why do, why are people fearful of differences? Well, it's differences and it's, and it's also, I mean, in a disability, you know, it's not, it's something you're afraid, you're afraid that it will, you know, that's one of the things, that's one of the points that the Maud episode made at the, at the end of the episode, the net for break confronts Maud because Maud has been uh, avoiding her for the whole episode. And she said, Maud, I know what, you know, what's happening. You're scared stiff of me. You know, I scare the daylights out of you. And B. Arthur Maud says, you're right. I am. I'm scared to death. And they sat down and they talked. And Jerry Jewell came to me once uh, oh. when the movie, when she, after she was cast on the Facts of Life. And she said, one of the most, uh, one of the most hurtful things for her was that children were afraid of her. And after she appeared on the Facts of Life, she said, kids come over to me on the street and in shopping malls and we sit and we talk. Uh -huh. and that's the power of the media. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing and it's amazing what you do. You, it, it's how you, you know, you take that little step, you plant the seed, you strike the match. Um, what is your biggest joy in life? Well, you know, it's given what the world is today, it's hard <laughs> to have joy in life. Also, because I really miss, uh, there have been so many changes in my lifetime, and I miss the world that I grew up in and the country that I grew up in. And I don't know if you've seen David Attenborough's great feature that he feature documentary that he made for Netflix about all the changes that have happened to the planet in his lifetime he's 90 years old it's amazing and every human being on the planet should watch it yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, the fact that the fact that I did things that were important and that touched people's lives that's important to me um, and I, you know, I get pleasure from writing from my books and stuff like that and from relationships but uh, today, in this world, there are letters to my husband. It's helping people to this day survive the loss of a loved one because so many, so many of us today have lost people and we didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye because we were separated. So that book deals with that because my husband died unexpectedly in the middle of the night. And I'm making copies of the book available to anybody who wants it. They just have to send me an email oh, wow, because wow. it's very helpful still to this day. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. definitely a healing and helpful book. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, like you said, it's a joy of writing, it's a joy of relationships and that's all in encompassing. Um, you know, one, one of the shows that you produced that that I remember growing up watching was The Wave. The Wave, yeah. I and, just, I'm, I'm still getting, I, I got a, an email not long ago, a woman, uh, you know, was so, so uh, impacted by that movie. It was, uh, it was astonishing and it's a true story. And in reality, it all took place in a week. I think we spread it out because we felt nobody would believe it. But Ron Jones is an extraordinary human being. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I did a couple of his movies and one of them was about the first basketball team in up north. Uh, so he's been working with uh, after after the wave, which had no, no dis disabled people in it. But he it, it has done a lot of work with disabled people up in the Bay Area. Right. Um, well, and it's so it's timely. timely. It's, I mean, what? it's timely. Yes, it is. It is. It, it, 
more than ever, unfortunately, more than ever. And uh, he said it was such an extraordinary experience for him and the students that they hadn't talked about it for like 40 years. And more recently, when they run into each other, uh, they start talking about the experience of the wave and, and what it meant in their lives. What was the, the log line of the wave? Um, probably, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't remember, but it's what, what uh, Bruce Davison, who plays Ron Jones, says at the, at the end, you know, he says, not to follow blindly and to question, you know, what the people in power may be saying, and God knows we should be questioning today the, what the people in power are doing and whether it's right or wrong and, you know, not being motivated only by our pocketbooks or whatever, but caring about each other, caring about people is, is the most important thing. And if we don't start caring about the human beings and the planet, we won't be here much longer. So true. I mean, after this interview, I think I'm going to go try to find it on, on YouTube and post it so people can watch it and say, oh, wow. And this was May when? You know? I think it was like that was around also it was also around the seventies. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there was the sixties. I have to look, it says so on the film. Yeah. I, I, think, it, I it. think it was the seventies, but I just remember how powerful it was and like you said, it's so it's so what we're you know, dealing with. Um I'm gonna throw out I mean, we talked about Jerry Jewell, um and 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 that story that it, I mean, you've had so many stories, and you were the one who discovered her with Norman, right? <laughs> well, what happened was the Media Access Awards, the first one, which was by accident. Right. You know, the, the funny story about the Media Access Awards was uh, I, was, I had been uh, invited to a governor's committee meeting, and uh, there was this very sexy guy in a wheelchair, Peter Arbalo, who challenged me during the Q&A and said, uh, all you media people, you're always coming, you're exploiting us, and then uh, you leave and we're, uh, and his sentence, which I will never forget, and we disappear into the back bedrooms of America. <laughs> Will you serve on a task force? And this was on the heels of the men and coming home. You know, there had been some major movies. So afterwards, you know, we talked and I said, look, you know, my, my way is not to chain anybody to the bus stop, but to go to the entertainment industry and say, here's the problem. You know, we need inclusion. And uh, would you help us? And so the way we were going to do that is we organized a dinner during a quarterly meeting of the governor's committee. Can you hear me? Is all that noise? It's, it's, it's like you're at an airport. <laughs> I can't believe what's going on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, so we decided we would do a panel discussion and I was invited the casting directors and the men and whatever and I was walking down the hall to uh, Norman Lear's office to invite him to the Media Access Awards because he had dealt with disabilities in about all his shows, you know, episodes. And I ran into Barbara Brogliotti, who was head of his PR, and I said, oh, Barbara, I'm just going to invite Norman to a dinner of the Governor's Committee. And she said, oh, are you giving him an award? And I thought, of course we are. <laughs> I thought, what a great way to ensure that somebody will show up. So that was the first Media Access Awards. I did a, a, a reel using excerpts from the shows that he had done. And he walked, I remember he walked in. I had the whole cast of Maud there because they were so terrific and so supportive. And he said, where's the press? And I said, well, I couldn't get anybody to come. And he shook his head and he said, if you were lying on the edge of the highway in an accident that put you in the wheelchair, you'd you'd have the press. And I said, yeah, well, but that was the beginning. And of course, because he was involved and then we, uh, you know, uh, and even he was involved before the Media Access Awards because I was making the movie, A Different Approach. 
and you know, I got everybody because my first line was, you know, Norman Lear is going to be in this film, and would you join him and everything? So that's that's how it all began. And Jerry, some uh, one of my colleagues called one day and said, "There's this fabulous comedian." a stand-up comedian and she's going to be performing Saturday on TV and you should definitely look at her and my stomach was crunching up and I'm saying please go away and leave me alone I can't do this anymore and of course Saturday when she was doing my husband and I whose name also happened to be Norman coincidentally we sat down and to watch Jerry Jewell and fell in love with Jerry Jewell and got to meet her and I had her perform at the second annual Media Access Award. And everything about this whole thing always has a story because Norman Lear was, of course, at the second Media Access Awards and Jerry performed and we all fell in love with her. And my husband brought her over to introduce her afterwards to Norman Lear, who was sitting next to Charlotte Ray. And I heard Norman turn to Charlotte and said, she should be on the Facts of Life. And I thought, what a fabulous idea. As soon as I got back to the office, I called the executive producer, who was Jack. Um, Jack uh, No. Uh, well, anyway, whatever. Uh, his name will come to me. And he said, well, we didn't have it get a second um, season pickup, so we don't have any more. We've got two more episodes. We've got the script. So I called right, Norman right. Lear and I said, you know, it's not going to happen. Well, a couple of weeks later, they got a pickup for season two. So I called Norman and I said, I heard they just got a pickup for seven two. So now we could do Jerry. He said, well, come down to the office. So I walked down to the office and he was there. I think Kathy Hand was there. And he beat out the, the, the I have the cassette from the meeting. And uh, that's how Jerry you know, that's how Cousin Jerry, the episode, was born on the facts of life, and the rest is history. History. Huh? history huh? It's, it's always, uh, it, there's always uh, a story. Oh, <laughs> there is Jerry, my, my wonderful, beautiful friend. Yes. And, yes. and we were, we, we fell in love, you know, what, <laughs> what, can, what can I tell you? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it was you planting the seed. It was you taking that match and, and lighting a new fire. Well, by accident, you know, I haven't invented, <laughs> you know, I don't know when it's, uh, when, when it's, I don't know about the impossible. I ask. Yeah. I ask questions. Everything, everything I've ever done in my life has been by accident. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and I want to tell you that another experience, this is, this is what was so important about how it changed our lives. When I was making the wave, yes. I was already involved in the disability community, and my AD came over to me, I think it was Michael Flick, and he, Michael Flick, and he said, Fern, we should have an extra in a wheelchair. And I went, oh, of course. And he pranced off to get me my extra in a wheelchair. And I went, oh my God, we're going to have an extra in a wheelchair. Uh, how do I explain this to Virginia Carter? And what is Norman Lear going to say? And what if there's an accident? And what if, what if, what if? And this went on in my head for about three days. And finally, on the fourth day, I'm getting ready, putting on makeup in the bathroom and going through this. And I stopped myself and I said, look at you. Look at what you're going through. And you're enlightened. I mean, you're in the middle of all of this. And you're talking to directors and producers and writers who aren't enlightened. And look how uncomfortable you are with the thought that there's going to be a person in a wheelchair on your set. So of course I stopped torturing myself, but I now I knew now I knew what we had to, you know, what was the obstacle to overcome, what was the mountain that had to be climbed. And I and I had a better understanding when we were talking to people of what it's about. And I was very fortunate to uh to meet and become involved in people that were incredible. And and interesting even before Facts of Life, 
I did a Cheech and Chong film. And I am not a wheelchair user. <laughs> I walked. And they were paranoid that I was walking anywhere on set. They go, what if she trips? What if she does this? What if she does that? Yeah. So they wouldn't let me walk anywhere. If I had to go to the restroom, excuse me, I need an electric cart. I need to go to the restroom. <laughs> so it's like everybody else's fear is far more dramatic and unreal than the person who actually has to deal with the real thing in life. Well, uh, tell what tell that wonderful story about what happened to you on the on the set on the studio lot when they wouldn't let you walk wherever you had to walk. They well, insisted. Well, one morning I showed up on Sunset Boulevard. My call was at four thirty a.m. I was exhausted and I was not allowed to walk from the parking lot up the hill to the set because again that involved walking. <laughs> So they tried to get me a car. They couldn't find one. None was available. And this truck came around the corner and they hailed him down and they said, hey, hey, you going up to the set? Yeah, man. I said, well, can you give Jewel a ride? I mean, she can't walk up there, man. Yeah, no problem, man. And he put me on the back of the truck and she, she said, now hold on. And he put the gas on and I let go and I fell out. Then and I broke my thumb, my finger. Oh my, my gosh. <laughs> I had to go to the emergency section. I think it was at Cedars and they had to wrap up my whole hand and everything. And because of that fall, I got cut from the movie. Oh my God, I didn't even know that last part. Oh, how sad. Oh, yeah, that? because they couldn't match the takes. I had worked on the film for three weeks with no oh. cast on my arm. Oh my gosh. And oh my so God. they couldn't match it, so they had to mix it completely. But third, it was a blessing in disguise because Chi okay. Chi Chang's film Nice Dreams came out came out the same time that I was on Fact of Life. Uh-huh. And had I been in the Cheech and Chong film and on Fact of Life with a G-rated show, they wouldn't have been too happy about that. So <laughs> Cheech and Chong was not supposed to happen. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, David, I sometimes I forget the first experience that I ever had, which was quite remarkable yeah. with a person in a wheelchair. Uh, I was a young newlywed. I was about 20, 21, 22 years old in Rome when Rome was fabulous. It was the time of La Dolce Vita. And somebody we had met on the ship uh, was uh, said, you can always find me at Jerry's. Jerry's was an American hamburger place. And uh, on our first night in Rome, we went down there and, and there was nobody left. It was after midnight. And there were these three guys. There was Aldo, the Italian playboy we had met on the ship. Jerry from Toyd Avenue and Toyd Toyd Street in Brooklyn, who was the owner of the restaurant. And Tom Harvey, who I didn't realize was a, le a legless veteran. And at a, we were chatting, et cetera. And at a certain point, Aldo says, oh my God, we're going to miss the late show at the Jiggy Club. Let's go. So now I see that the uh, is legless. Aldo, who's a black belt, stocky guy, takes Tom on his shoulders. We go up the stairs, because the restaurant was down the stairs. Tom and Jerry go and hit their car. Aldo takes us on two wheels in his two-seater sports car. There are three of us through a, 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 a ride in the Villa Borghese. And we get to the nightclub. And we go down to the, and at a certain point, we're sitting there, I and mean, he's met other friends. And at a certain point, Tom Harvey turns to me and says, would you like to dance? 
and I, you know, my my heart stopped. And I said, I said, of course, you know, what am I gonna say? So I'm walking to the dance floor. He's behind me, and I'm thinking, what's gonna happen? Is he gonna grow legs? Will this wheelchair vis disappear? What is gonna happen? And it was a time when the mambo and the rumba, those were the things dancing. So I turned around and there Tom had propped himself up in the wheelchair, put a strong arm around my waist, maneuvered the wheelchair with his other arm and we rumbled. But the most remarkable thing was nobody paid attention. They were so used to Tom Harvey going all over the place and dating the most beautiful women in town that nobody paid attention. And Tom was part of the group. If you needed something from the kitchen, Tom was the first one to wheel down the hall. I mean, it was amazing, but I'll never forget that moment or that question, would you like to dance? Sure. <laughs> I love that. Oh. It was, uh, you know, so it's been an interesting journey, and I, I'm surprised I'm still here. Well, I'm still here. <laughs> right. This, so, I, I, I'm going to throw out a name and see where it takes you. Monk. Monk. Well, you know, Monk was uh, was a terrific. Everything has a story. Was a great experience. Um, we, the show idea was pitched by our executive producer, David Hoberman, who happened to have been OCD when he was a teenage, uh, you know, growing up. So uh, that's what it was. But uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't, you know, we, we just dealt with it. It was, you know, that was part of his thing. And uh, Tony did research on it. And uh, we, uh, we really, uh, I and and one, our show one our, our showrunner we had wanted to do an episode with Marley Matlin etc but that we it didn't fly mm. it was an Emmy but it <laughs> it didn't fly and uh, Tony was an extraordinary talent he's an extraordinary uh, um, actor and the interesting thing was I was once showing a rough cut of one of my favorite episodes, which was the Willie Nelson episode in Italy. You know, they understood the language, et cetera, but they got, they understood the character so well that when there's this, he's been invited to play with the Willie Nelson and the guys on a, on a radio show. And at one point, just before he's supposed to play, the musician standing next to him grabs the clarinet, puts it in his mouth and says, this is the way you're supposed to use it. And of course, Monk now can't put it in his mouth. You know, he wipes it on the guy's sleeve, et cetera. But it, the, he had made such a clear character that in Italy, when the musician did that, the whole room gasped because they knew how it would be for, for uh, Monk that he would not. And it was really Chaplin-esque what he did, especially before you edited it, because you see him going, through all the stages, like, oh my God, I can't do this. But this is a once in a lifetime experience. So I have to get past it, but I can't. You see him going through all these feelings, knowing that this opportunity will never be back. It was amazing. Another wow. groundbreaking show? Yeah. Well, it was, thank, you know, we didn't know it would, how long it would go. They hired me originally to uh, mount the show in, in Canada because Tony had been doing a feature there and I had worked, done a lot of work in Canada. So uh, I was hired as the line producer and, uh, and then we came back. It was a hit, you know, it, it was a hit because everybody fell in love. The, the audience and the critics fell in love with Tony. And it was great, and it was, you know, but basically, it, it, that's a show that really hinged on our star, mm. you know, because the shtick that he would come up with, uh, uh, and, and just, and, and the fact that he was, he became the character and got it, it was, uh, it was terrific, it lasted eight seasons. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've been honored with so much 
you know, for your work in inclusion and employment with people with disabilities, uh, two Peabody Awards, two H Humanitas Awards, um, uh, and you, re you received the Distinguished Service Award from Ronald Reagan. Yes, I did. Not personally. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, yes. Well, the, the head of the committee that we had done, you know, a different approach for, she nominated me. I didn't even know when it was, the, that it was, that it had been, that I had been submitted. Uh, but it was lovely. But I told you, uh, uh, Jerry, you know, my friend Tom Backer, who's in the nonprofit oh, world, oh. he nicknamed me a social issues groupie because every, everything that he ever participated in, and I would be there, you know, whether it was a coalition for clean air or recycling or this, that, and the other thing. Um, I think it matters. I think it matters. Yeah. And, you know, there are lots of people, on the one hand, I, I said, you know, I'm, I miss the world I grew up in, and I think that we're not paying close enough attention. And then like on a Saturday morning, I see a show on CBS and a couple of weeks ago, the, the, you know, the scientists have, have invented a sidewalk, a concrete sidewalk that collects water and processes it. And it's just amazing. Uh, so, you know, uh, when I get to feeling pessimistic, I think of the and people, you know, what we're doing. And uh, there are some people who say, no, you know, the world is okay because technology will solve all the problems. I, I'm not so sure, but um, maybe it will. I, uh, you know, I don't know. Yin and yang. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, and also there came a time like after the, the fourth Media Access Awards, when I started traveling to locations on production. So I really was not that actively involved. Then every time I would be back in LA for something, I think maybe around the sixth or the seventh, I might've been involved again and at the 25th. But in the beginning, the first, the first, the first four, uh, I, the first three I did by myself. Oh, I did it. I don't know. I had a secretary and an office, and I was working for Norman Lear, which opened all the doors, but I didn't. Uh, when we got to the third, which I realized after doing two of them, that it was just as much work doing a small one as a big one. So I decided, and we needed to raise money, because the other thing I realized is that doing this once a year isn't going to isn't going to make any difference because we need to be doing this every day, every single day. So I decided we needed a media access office. We needed to raise money, et cetera. So I moved this from the Holiday Inn in Westwood to the Century Plaza in Century City. And, and a lot of people went ballistic because I, the ticket went from $25 to $125. And the, the word was, but the disabled people, you know, won't be able to afford it. And I said, but we're not really talking to the disabled people. We're talking to the non-disabled people about opening the doors and inclusion and employment and everything. And we need to raise money. So anyway, uh, we did that. But the third annual Media Access Awards was so incredible because there was so much love in the room. And so many people showed up at the last minute that we actually made money. I think that was the only time in the history until now Easter Seals is involved. But that year, uh, we raised money. We like netted $80,000. And uh, that's when they realized, and I, of course, didn't know anything about this. I didn't know what a 501c3 was. I didn't know anything. And the, the governor's committee and the South Bay mayor's committee, they realized they were not allowed to to raise money. So that's when the governor's oh, committee right. and the friends of the governor's committee of 501c3. So that was happened with, uh, you know, that. And the other good thing that happened was after I made a different approach where nobody got paid, you know, because we had received a grant the, the South Bay Mayor's Committee had received a grant. We'd asked for 50000 We got 40000 Of course, it cost more than that to make. 
But uh, what happened was, first of all, uh, first of all, they got the money because their treasurer was, uh, you know, like a bulldog with a bone. The government never gives money in advance. Mm -hmm. But the South Bay Mayor's Committee didn't have a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, and we needed money to make the movie. So he badgered them long enough to where the, gover the government gave him the money in advance. So that's when we started uh, to produce uh, the film. But after the, but very, very few people got paid, maybe some post-production people. Uh, afterwards, at a certain point when it was so successful and started to win awards, Disney called me and wanted to produce, wanted to distribute the film. And they would give us like, you know, 20% of 80%. And I, and I thought, well, but how can I give this to a commercial distributor when nobody got paid? You know, I didn't think that was a good idea. So I decided for the wrong reason and <laughs> not to give it to Disney. And the committee, the South Bay Mayor's Committee started to distribute it on its own to corporations and it word of mouth. And the South Bay Mayor's Committee made like half a million dollars. And we were able to recycle that money into the community. So we did scholarships, we did ramps in cars, we bought vans, we did all this work that had I not been stupid and turned down a good distribution, <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to do it. But it was so great. What we did, all the scholarships and everything came from that. Yeah. I was lucky. What would you tell, I mean, we have over 100 students watching today and uh, from Performing Arts Studio West and Meet the Biz and, and the YouTube world. What would you tell students who wanted to get into producing and creating their own material and how to go about it? Well, first of all, it is a very different world than when I was doing it. There are many more buyers, there are many more suppliers, and the doors are open. You know, the, uh, I talk to people at the Media Access Awards and stuff like that. And it's hard for me to give, uh, to give advice because in my world, there were, uh, how shall I say it? There were parameters. Mm. You know, there was some things that you did and some things that you didn't do. Now, it's more of a free-for-all. Almost anything goes. You know, Whatever I used to fits. tell... What? Whatever fits. Yes. And when I used to teach, I used to say, uh, you know, a script needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, that's no longer true. Because a lot of things that are out there don't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so, so I say to some of my... Uh, contemporaries who go off and, and they're, they're uh, consultants, I say, what do you tell them? You can't, you know, what is there to say? Because today, if you shoot a film with your iPhone and it goes viral, people will come to you with money and distribution offers and stuff like that. It's it, a lot of thing and a lot of talent comes out of that. So it's, it's a different world and it's hard for me to, uh, to know what really to it, but I still think that if you really, if you really know how to make a movie, they live on, and there are standards. But if you look at a lot of the the projects that are getting awards these days, and you look at some of the projects that made it years ago, in my opinion, there's they're as different as night and day, which which is not which doesn't have to be a judgmental thing. Uh, you know, anything yeah. goes. So, yeah, I, I would say first of all, I think that material needs to be honest, and it needs to have some universal appeal. You know, when I when I wrote letters to my husband, uh, I wrote letters to my husband because I knew that the pain that I was feeling was not unique to me, that there were a lot of people out there who had suffered the loss of a life of a loved one, 
that were feeling the way I did. And I was brutally honest about myself, about my feelings, and about what was going on. And my readers responded to that. So yeah. I think, yeah, so I think, and I mean, look who I'm talking to. If you've read Jerry's book, it's an amazing book. Uh, it, 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 it you make you laugh, it makes you cry. It's extraordinary. She's had an extraordinary life. She's a fabulous writer and it's amazing. And she's honest, you know, she tells it like it is. And I think that is a very important aspect to being, uh, to being successful. Um, so, you know, you, you look at what are your favorite uh, projects that are out there? What, what did they used to be and, and what, when I, I remember when I walked out after I saw Amadeus mm. on the screen, I was really depressed and my husband said to me, what's the matter with you? And I said, I will never be able to do something that's as wonderfully done as that. So there are these, these projects out there and I hope I'm still doing, I mean, I'm still doing, I'm still writing, I've got the, uh, and I've got, I'm able to, to express some of my feelings about human nature through my cat, which I had many years ago. So I've got the Destiny trilogy and book two is about to come out and Destiny's children. And it's got great observations about how we humans, <laughs> you know, deal with it and how often she had a look uh, at me with her look. Are you really going to do that? <laughs> for another look was why are we here <laughs> so you know and then Jerry's a cat person and Jerry uh, coined the word Meowmar so my, my <laughs> destiny trilogy is a Meowmar <laughs> that was really a good idea <laughs> <laughs> my kitty yeah yeah so I, 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 I do have to say that in a way it's full circle because in 2017, you were awarded at the Media Access Award, the Norman Lear Jerry Jewell Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was, that that was, was amazing. That was very special. I was especially thrilled because Michael Keaton came. Michael oh, Keaton yeah. was like uh, starting out and he had a small role, I think it was in All Spare, which starred Bernadette Peters and Richard Crenna. And he would, would, would Jim Belcher, who I got involved uh, again by accident, uh, and I were creating the show and we needed a young filmmaker which, because this is, it's a film within a film. So we thought that uh, Michael would be perfect and, but, you know, when I asked him and he said at the, at the media access luncheon, he said he just wanted the gig. You know, I came to him. He would have done anything. But we didn't know. We didn't hear from him. We didn't even know if he would show up. We weren't paying anybody. And so we had a backup. We've got one guy there who's uh, like this assistant to somebody on the committee in case Michael didn't show up. But Michael showed up and did a fabulous job of okay. this filmmaker who was making this movie to encourage employment of, and then in those days we said the handicap. So it was fabulous. And the fact that he was at the, uh, at the uh, media access well, awards, right. that was really very special for me. Mm -hmm. It was really yeah. Norman yeah. Norman yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it was an incredible day. I was so proud to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, it was, it was very special. And, you know, again, if it, as I said, uh, if I had been working for Mary Tyler Moore, they wouldn't have done an episode like that. They were, you know, it was because I was working for Norman Lear because Norman never said no. You know, he showed up. He showed up at the first Media Access Awards when he got, we gave him an award. You know, that's how it was for. Uh, and if I had had, had, had Barbara Bobiotti not asked me that question, we wouldn't have awards. But it was really, of course, in the, uh, another person that really above and beyond was Lorene Arbus, oh, because uh, I had hired her and her husband to do an episode on a show I was doing, again, for Norman Lear. And uh, 
she was asking me about the, the Media Access Awards and that she would like to be involved, et cetera. I said, fine, that was just before I was moving. It was the third annual and I was moving it to Beverly Hills. The two things happened to me on that thing. Uh, Lorene showed up one day and she said, well, who's on your committee? And you know, but nobody was on my committee. I had some kind of a committee, but people would always come to me with, oh, it would be great to get so-and-so. You know, but then they would leave and I should go get so-and-so. And I said, well, you know, we, we don't really have a dinner. She said, Fern, you can't do this. You need to have every studio head, every network head, et cetera, on your dinner committee. And I, and, uh, I said, well, and she said, well, she said, I'll do it. I said, uh, Lorene, the uh, invitations have to go to the day. She looked at her I said, how much time do I have? I said, until three o'clock. And she left. And by three o'clock, we had half the studio and network heads part of our dinner committee, which we were able to include in the uh, thing. So she was, you know, I mean, she was remarkable. And, and she was, she bailed us out on, on a number of occasions because it was very difficult to maintain the office, the awards, et cetera. It wasn't until now when the uh, Easter Seals have gotten involved that it's, you know, everybody could breathe a little bit, but it's been a climb, an uphill climb uh, every year. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Lorene was incredible and, and she put us on the map. She really did. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. And oh, uh, well, this was real fun. And I'm so glad, Jerry, that I got a chance to talk to you. It's so fabulous. See, yes. this, oh, is, this, is where you. this is where technology is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And I love surprises. I thought, oh, I'll bring you, you know, we'll surprise Fern a little by having Jerry here. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. I love you both. Oh, uh, well. Love you guys. We love you. We love you. I have to. I have to tell you one thing about Maude, though. Yeah. I watched Maude every week with my mom. It was a. It's a memory that is just in my head. We would sit on the couch. We would. I would hold her hand. I would lay my head on her lap, and we would laugh every week. Well, two things. Did you ever see uh, the episode where Maude goes to the shrink? Probably because I used to go to the shrink and I still do. <laughs> well, uh, and I did. I mean, I, I went to three shrinks uh, and the last one was a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Uh, my first one was Kurt Adler, uh, was Alfred Adler's son. Uh, but uh, the, the thing about, where was I going with this? Uh, my God. Maud, right. So uh, Maud, uh, this this script came to us over the transom. It was a spec script by a writer and it was a solo. It was a 24, 22 minute solo. Maud talking to the psychiatrist. All you saw in the episode was the shrink's shoulder and he never said anything. She just, it's amazing. It, the monologue, it's a monologue. It's a 22 minute monologue. It's amazing. And then my other, favorite line was from the episode it was before my time on the show but uh, Maud uh, is pregnant and you know she's oh, so oh, and, and, and Adrian Barbeau her daughter and it's about abortion and Maud is debating you know what she should do and she's hesitating <laughs> and Adrian says but mom You've been a proponent of abortion, you know, for years, and you've. Uh, and Maud says, "Yes, but I wasn't pregnant then." And that is an amazing insight into, you know, how how we function. There are times when we believe something strongly, and something makes us hesitant. You know, it's just it was terrific. She was fabulous. I, my, I mean, she was formidable and you know when I first went to work she was like I, she was larger than life to me but she never said no I could call her I called her to be a narrator on a film I did for the Department of Mental Health whenever you called me she she was there 
And after my husband died and after the show went off the air, we continued to be friends with Maud and Rue and this and that. And one day, it was a particularly difficult day on the shoot. I was doing Counter-Strike in Toronto with Christopher Plummer and, and it was a tough, it was like midnight. And I was the last one at the studio. And on the public address system, uh, the, the night guy says, Burnfield, B. Arthur's on the phone. And oh, B. Arthur, oh my God, I picked up the phone and she said, Bernsey, I was thinking about you and I wanted to call and say, this was right after my husband died. And I wanted to call you and tell you I love you and just say hello. I said, B, you don't know how much this phone call meant to me. It was been a terrible day uh -huh. and it was just amazing. Yeah. They were terrific, all those guys were, it was a great cast. Uh, it was a great time to be working for Norman Lear. It was a family and, uh, and we cared. We cared about the content. We cared about what was going on. Norman, if the show, if an episode was having a problem, the call would go to Norman's office and he would be down at the studio. And he could take a line from one character and give it to another character and all of a sudden it was brilliant and it worked. Yeah. It was a great time. Wow. wow. Yeah, it was a great time. <laughs>